Uh, welcome to all newcomers. Um, as, as you hopefully know, this is the Finos Open Source Readiness uh, Working Group meeting. We meet uh, every other Wednesday at 10 a.m. Eastern. Um, today, we are fortunate to have Ibrahim Haddad from the Linux Foundation, uh, who's going to be speaking on the topic of improving the impact of enterprise uh, open source development participation. Uh, Ibrahim, uh, please feel free to go ahead and give uh, a little uh, deeper introduction into your into your background, uh, and then and then go ahead and take it away. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Haddad, and um, I'm really thankful and grateful for for being invited to to speak with to you and with you about um, open source kind of enterprise um, development. Uh, my background, um, you know, has been, you know, by education, I'm, I'm an engineer. I, I studied computer science and I have a PhD in computer science. And throughout my experience for the past two plus decades, I've been focused um, or my work has been focused across multiple company all around um, kind of using and creating software in open source and using these components as enabling technologies that can be in you know, infrastructure, um, telecom infrastructure at Ericsson and Motorola or on the mobile side um, at Samsung and Palm. Um, and um, I've led uh, open source uh, engineering team and established um, OSPOs, open source program offices. And my last experience with that was Samsung um, where I spent six years and I created and launched the open source group there. Um, Today at the LF, I, I lead the LFAI Foundation, which is an umbrella foundation focused on accelerating the development in the critical open source AI projects. Uh, my talk today is actually um, a spin-off of a talk I did at the FINAS event um, in November in New York. And uh, the genesis of, of that talk comes from different conversations I've had with a lot of people on um, you know, how companies today have the opportunity, uh, you know, companies today entering open source uh, from different uh, industries have the opportunity to look back and examine, uh, you know, how other companies starting from the early 2000s got involved with open source and learn from their practices, um, you know, experience um, and, and kind of look at, at the errors these companies made in the early days and avoid them today and also look at what worked well and kind of adopt that. So um, so this this was kind of the talk I did at Finance event and I kind of expanded a little bit today since um, the Finance event was limited to 25 minutes. Um, so um, as you can see, I have, um, I have a chart now um, from a Linux Foundation new stack collaboration survey and I'll be putting a few of these throughout the talk. Um, and um, just to let you know, all these survey results are actually available on GitHub from the to-do group, so you can get all these charts uh, from there. Uh, so basically, um, part of the survey was a question about, um, you know, where is your um, company or organization uh, is on the open source journey? And you can see the question where companies are consuming, contributing, uh, launching new projects. Um, and uh, what's really interesting is... Oh, just, just jump in. I'm, I'm not actually seeing anything on the share. Uh, so, Simon, I think this is an issue with just a couple of users and, and what, you know, what we've used to log in. Uh, I, I'm told others are able to see it, but I've also uh, sent around the slides, so you should have them in your... Okay, email. cool. Thanks, Simon. Uh, so, I assume you're able... Some people are able to see it, right? Um, yeah, we can see it. Thank you. So, um, oops. something happened on my screen. Okay. So, yeah, what's really interesting about that is if you look at the results of that basic question, um, large tech companies with over 10,000 employees are a lot more far advanced in consuming, contributing, collaborating, launching new projects, and so on. And we'll be talking about these companies and what they do. Um, so, one really interesting thing. Uh, is, um, you know, the benefits of open source. I'm going to go quickly on that. We all are aware of kind of development speed 
uh, the ability to customize code, um, you know, security benefits, performance, and, and so on. However, one of the um, areas I'd like to emphasize, not just kind of on the purely tactical side of benefits, but also the strategic value of open source. And typically I illustrate this in kind of uh, six different areas. First one is, you know, you look at open source as just another tool in your toolbox where you collaborate with uh, academia, you work with VCs, uh, you kind of support startups and collaborate with them and open source. And of course you have your internal R&D and all of these are tools for your um, innovation in your own products and services and open source is just one of these tools. Uh, also open source is extremely critical. Um, you know, we're all famous, uh, you know, aware of the famous meme, you know, from Andreessen, uh, from Mark Andreessen on, you know, open software is eating the world. Um, that was about 10 years ago. And today we see open source um, as eating the software by mean of, you know, under that large software umbrella, uh, the largest part of that software being created is actually open source. Um, so you have to be, uh, you want to be good in software, you have to be good in open source. Uh, of course, the flexible licensing, licensing um, you know, I mentioned I was at Samsung for, for six years and product dependency uh, is extremely strong argument in favor of open source uh, involvement. So this is actually the, the bottom left um, product dependency is actually a slide I used to use uh, when I was at Samsung uh, when I do my fundraising. As you know, open source teams are uh, kind of a cost center and every year we need to, to go and raise money. And what better argument to fund us when every single product we ship actually contains code coming from open source anywhere between 20 to 80 percent, right? Uh, of course, product enablement, uh, there's what I call direct enablement and indirect enablement. There's a lot of support that comes from open source to product in different ways. And uh, if you're familiar with the Pareto principle, you know, the 80-20, uh, open source is actually a great innovation enabler from that perspective, where you're able to get 80% of the lift from open source, and that will allow you to focus um, your 20, your, your, uh, your engineers and your efforts on the 20% that are the critical value of your product. So, so basically, the bottom line is that smart companies really have or need to have a, an open source strategy, and it's not something uh, open source that you can ignore today in, in today's um, uh, environment. Um, so what one interesting thing as a follow up to that is the rise of open source program offices. Um, as you may be aware, um, in the past few years, um, we've heard a lot about companies establishing open source program offices. Uh, it used to be called different names, open source groups, open source program office or other names. Uh, and um, what's really interesting is these offices existed in one way, shape or form, even from the early 2000s. And IBM was the first in 2000 with their Linux Technology Center, LTC. Intel established their, their, their center, uh, OTC Open Source Technology Center in 2002. And actually I was at Ericsson uh, Research in 2000 and we created uh, the Open, Open Systems Lab. So it's actually a lab um, it's called a lab because you know we we are in research focused on using open technologies to to support kind of the telecom um, um, hardware that we you know we create. Um, so today, um, even in in finance, uh, I'm aware of multiple companies who set up this office and hired some people to turn it, and some other companies that are actually in the hiring process to to hire leaders for that. Um, and these are offices typically that are responsible for everything open source within the company from consumption to contribution to policies, processes, uh, tool, tooling, um, you know, kind of awareness, outreach, and, and, and so on. Uh, so they act as kind of the clearing house of open source within the organization. Um, and typically, if we look at uh, a company's journey in open source, uh, they typically start consuming open source. Uh, and as a result of con consuming open source, and, you know, as whether building product or cleaning service, um, then they move into 
setting up a compliance program because you know once they ship the the product they have to comply and then typically they start participating in different communities contributing and then um, they aim to gain a leadership position in different communities or projects that are critical to their products and you know i've seen this chart in different ways different companies you know they they kind of illustrate the, the their journey and you know different keywords but this is kind of basically uh, the path that most companies go through and you know you cannot just jump in to become a leader unless you kind of you go and, and kind of you, you know you start from the bottom up and building your um, um, your position uh, and typically you know at the beginning from a consumption perspective a lot of companies even though a lot you know some executive may not be aware but uh, the consumption part is usually engineering driven you know engineers are you know, part of that ecosystem, they're, they'd like to reuse code, go and see what's out there and try to adapt it. And as it as the the, the adoption becomes more involved and uh, wider within the company, it becomes kind of more driven by by uh, by business strategy and, and, and other factors. Uh, and uh, typically within the first one, which is uh, the first phase, with this, which is the kind of the consumption part, uh, you know, it is companies and, you know, start using open source because it gives them, you know, different advantages or basically the developers within the company start using open source, um, you know, for, for different uh, advantages, whether it's, you know, the availability of functionality that is out there, uh, you know, readiness, you know, the uh, features uh, and so on. Um, and um, for getting and setting up that kind of healthy consumption um, environment, typically companies need to create, um, you know, what I would call kind of different supporting elements within the company to enable to enable that, uh, you know, both on the consumption and compliance side, because they see them go together. Um, and that includes um, different different aspects, as you can see on the slide, there's kind of the strategy part, um, kind of very basic stuff like the portal, uh, policy and process for using um, open source and for com compliance purposes, integrating compliance um, as part of the development process, setting up a team, uh, in this case for, you know, focus on ensuring compliance, um, a lot of education, right, on, you know, company policies, training on uh, licenses, um, different checklists, you know, different checkpoints, creating checkpoints in, in, in different processes, you know, non-development processes. Uh, setting up the tooling uh, and in some cases participating in different industry initiative uh, that support the consumption and compliance practices. Um, and, um, you know, at, at least the companies I've been to, I've worked in like six, seven companies in, in the past few years. And, you know, we start with that and then we kind of automatically start drifting into participating in different projects and contributing to them. Um, and once you get to that point, um, then um, you need to adjust and include and support additional kind of building blocks within your internal uh, open source infrastructure. And by infrastructure, not, I don't mean kind of IT infrastructure, just you know, processes and policies and, and, and training and guidelines and, and tooling kind of to enable that participation. Um, and the contribution on the one, you know, when you get to the contribution part, uh, you, you know, most companies, if not all, they have a certain policy that guides the contributions, they have, um, uh, you know, a process for that. Um, and at that point, companies start evaluating, hey, you know, whether they should have an open source program office or, you know, some kind of, of, um, of team that oversees the company's involvement in open source projects and, and oversee their, their, um, participation in foundations and uh, and so on. And this is where kind of the, the concept of OSPO comes in as a dedicated group focused on, um, you know, everything uh, open source within the company. Uh, and in some cases, you know, depending on what the company works in which domain in which technology for its vertical, uh, in some cases, um, you start also getting involved in standardization aspects and providing an open source reference implementation and whatnot. And, um, in many cases, this is kind of a collaboration between OSPOs and the various product teams. 
Um, and of course, leadership, uh, you know, once you get to that point, uh, this, this requires kind of increased investments across the board from, you know, additional engineers to work on upstream projects um, to um, um, kind of have increase of headcount and maybe project management and improving the presence of your OSPO, you know, additional hires on the strategy side, on um, the foundation side and, and, and so on. Uh, and basically, when you look at these different uh, phases, you know, moving from consumer to participant and up to the um, kind of leader, and of course, you know, you cannot be kind of quote unquote leader in general. Your you know companies lead in different projects in different communities. You can be a leader in in a few communities and kind of a consumer for others, and you know, basic contributor in some other projects as well, right? So it's not kind of a global umbrella. Uh, and as as you move from evaluating to using and deploying as, as we show on the chart, you know, you transition automatically from one, um, one phase into the app, into another uh, with additional um, uh, involvement and, and investment in, in these different projects that you, you care about. Um, and what's really interesting, you know, on the financial side uh, or financial services, according to the, to, to the survey, the financial industry in general is a heavy user um, of open source and less so of a contributor. Uh, however, you know, at least from the interactions we've been having in the past few months, uh, and by the way, this survey is at least six months old. Um, so um, this is changing and we're, we're, we're seeing just by the fact of how many financial companies out there that are involved in, in Finos are actually hiring uh, to launch uh, their open source program offices or have already done so. So this, there's really uh, a lot of optimism in, in maybe next year or in end of 2020 um, to see the financial services industry higher on the uh, contribution side. So um, some of the recommended practices, um, so going back to what I mentioned earlier um, in the talk about kind of looking at these different companies that, um, that entered the open source domain, you know, maybe 20 and 15 years ago and have done really well. So looking at them and trying to figure out, you know, what have they done um, that worked for them? And this is basically where I'm, I'm listing these different practices. Um, so creating an open source program office, uh, this is really um, one of my favorite things to do as, 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 a, as an individual working in companies is to go and set up the office and, hire for it and build the company's practices and open source and so on. Um, and we can see that, um, um, you know, uh, from the survey results, you know, a very high positive impact um, resulting from, from a company creating that open source program. Uh, and, and also, you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, the finance, financial services industry is up there in terms of getting involved in, in following uh, that path of setting up um, that office that manages um, their open source presence and, and activities and contributions. Um, hire or promote a leader for open source office. Uh, you definitely need a leader for it. Um, you know, looking just how open source is kind of grassroots within the company until it becomes of a certain importance and then it's taken over by business strategy. You know, there are typically a lot of people within the company um, that have driven that adoption internally to a point where it became visible and worthy of an open source program office. So one of the things I always uh, mention to, to companies I work with is, you know, try to identify talent within your company um, and, you know, for, for, for that, for the, kind of that leadership uh, position, because in most cases, you as a company wouldn't have reached the, the tipping point of thinking and wanting to establish an open source office. Um, without a lot of work that, you know, whether developers or others have done within the company. So basically trying to identify talent there. Uh, identify your reliance on open source software. So this is actually one of the early exercises that most companies go through in terms of, okay, where, where are we using open source? How many components do we have? And try to identify kind of the open source bill of material, uh, which is basically the listing of all open source uh, components used across all products and services. And this is really a great starting point 
um, where you go through that prioritization uh, exercise as well, where, of course, you know, having worked at Samsung and Motorola and, and HP and others, you know, we use uh, thousands of open source components. However, we don't have resources to focus on all thousands of these components. Um, so going through the exercise of identifying what components we, we use and where and what's their criticality to our products and services and we follow a certain grading scheme, um, all that exercise helps us to pinpoint, you know, the top 25, 50 components that are critical to us that um, we would be severely affected if these communities don't continue to thrive um, and grow. And that gives us guidelines on where we should invest our kind of um, resources and, and, and headcount. Um, so this is, um, um, this is one view for it. Another view is uh, as the head of the open source program office, typically, you know, you, you, you're extremely restricted in, in headcount and, and, and the sources. And you want to make sure that whatever investment you do um, will lead the most results. And myself, as having gone through this multiple times, I always favored investing in open source communities um, that uh, where these projects are being used by at least two business units or two products, which gives me as a head of possible kind of uh, kind of redundancy from a funding perspective, and also gives me kind of a two for one or three for one where we do. Um, we do um, kind of we invest in a project and that project gives result for multiple products right so increasing our our impact internally within the company um, identify current and target open source position so a lot of companies um, you know some of them are extremely large tech companies are very um, um, satisfied just being as a as a consumer right uh, others want to become a leader and and want to exercise influence and have developers become committers and maintainers in different communities that they rely on, on, on them. So, um, so I think one of the exercises that's extremely useful is to identify okay, where you are today on that scheme and um, where do you want to get and kind of chart a path from current position to desired position. And that basically your strategy and, and create a tactical plan for that. Um, and you know each um, each position, uh, as mentioned in the previous slide, require different investments and action plan. Uh, but that gives you kind of a, a starting point. Or of you know we've looked at the company today. We are so many open source components in these different products, and we have few engineers uh, you know uh, spread across these different communities. Uh, and our goal is to become um, you know a leader in these projects and we're gonna our goal is to become kind of contributor in these other communities and for the other kind of non-critical project we're gonna remain a consumer right without any um, any contribution into this project um and and that gives you kind of a, a lot a lot to work with uh develop and execute an open source strategy which is kind of a sum of everything i've said so far in the past few uh, for the past few slides and that involves kind of uh, aspects in relation to technical work, to aspects to legal on the licensing, uh, aspects in relation to products, ecosystem development, uh, and a lot of business consideration in, that relates directly to your product, uh, to, to, to your specific company. Um, so a lot of so I put up here some questions just kind of to provoke thought um, on what in, you know what entails being you know thinking about an open source strategy. Uh, you know, how can an open source strategy accelerate your organization? Uh, how can it achieve your corporate goals, right? I mean, a lot of companies, um, you know, I don't know of a single company that wants to involve in open source because engineers find it fun and it's like cool and things like that. I mean, it's all about bottom line, it's all about accelerating product, um, you know, leveraging engineering resources, uh, improving innovation, collaborating with others, and so on. So uh, there are always kind of business objectives driving this involvement. And, the open source strategy help you kind of um, identify these and um, relate them to open source and kind of put a plan for that. Uh, how can open source strategy help you achieve your IP strategy, right? Uh, and are you able to use open source as a tool to create um, new opportunities that are otherwise unattainable? I mean, think of uh, providing a reference implementation to a standard and suddenly 
your implementation becomes kind of a de facto uh, uh, used by everybody else, right? But you know, that's a great opportunity for you there. So there are a lot of things in relation to open source strategy. Um, and you know, sometimes I feel saying open source strategy is kind of too wide of a map to throw out there. Um, but, but I think um, you know, these questions can help you frame your mind and, and uh, help you think of it maybe in a different light. Uh, implement uh, an open source enabling environment. That includes everything from policies, processes, tooling, um, um, getting involved in uh, foundations, compliance initiative, and so on. And um, um, you know, to give you an idea, you know, when I joined Samsung in 2013, I was the first hire, um, and I was hired to establish kind of, you know, the open source organization, build it up. Uh, and at that point, you know, Samsung was not known as a software company nonetheless being a software contributor in, in, in open source and you know you know i joined and uh what was really interesting is you know there was kind of no standard laptop linux laptop issue there's no you know vpn support there's no imap email um you need to go uh, if you want to go through github you need to request uh, to the github website you need to request uh firewall exception i mean it, it was really a nightmare Right, and by no means any software developer, um, nonetheless, open source developer wants to be in that environment. Um, and it, it took me about a year, uh, kind of, to change that and, and move from that extremely limited environment um, where it's excruciating for an open source developer to, to live in into a much more open environment. Um, and you know, in, in my case, I just moved the IT infrastructure for. The open source team into AWS, you, you know, just as an example, and and we opened up everything. So we had our own Git servers, Wiki. Um, you know, I even we even had an IRC server. Uh, we had our own emailing system. So I was Ibrahim at uh, osg.org, right? So um, so the the whole point is, you know, try to identify friction point and kind of remove them. And the whole idea is. To enable open source within the company and kind of not to restrict it. Uh, provide a flexible IT environment. I think I mentioned that. Uh, you know, we you know we're in 2020 and still uh, we face IT uh, restrictions, especially when it comes to the different tooling allowed within the company. But then, uh, you know, the tools that we may be using in, inside the company, um, we need other tools, you know, for collaboration purposes with people outside the company and so on. So. Um, so look at your IT environment and, and, and ask yourself the question, you know, what can we improve there to make it easier for our developers and to make their, their workflow uh, much more smooth and, 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 and uh, kind of and, 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 and easy, really, and, and execute on that and, and kind of improve that IT infrastructure. Uh, build expertise in key uh, open source technical uh, areas, ecosystem, community, strategy, all of that. Uh, and one of the very effective ways that I found throughout the years in different companies was, you know, starting by hiring kind of what I call an anchor, an anchor hire. You know, if you don't have expertise in kernel development, uh, we're not going to go hire 50 <laughs> kernel developers. First, they don't exist. I mean, it's extremely hard. Um, and then you're going to still have the problem longer term. Uh, so what I found that works really well is to hire one or two key developers uh, in specific areas that we want to build up and ramp up and have them uh, train and mentor uh, kind of um, less experienced developers. Um, and that worked as, as, as a way for us to, to kind of scale our experience and, and, and our expertise in a specific domain, because obviously we cannot go and hire everybody. Uh, and so we just hire a couple of people and have them help us build that expertise. And it's not just technical, it's uh, you know, people who know how to work with foundations, people who know how um, to set, you know, different software strategy, participate with with other uh, software leaders within the company, uh, and 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 be part of the uh, kind of the vision of you know where we want to go as part of our transformation from whatever company into a software driven company. Uh, create meaningful metrics to to track progress. Uh, you know, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. But also, uh, there are a lot of um, challenges when it comes to kind of measuring 
um, and create, coming up with metrics for open source uh, developers. And the the example I often give is if you if you if you want to implement a feature to improve um, battery life, or, you know, or, or or you basically to to improve power management in the kernel. Um, and you assign that to to a couple of your developers working on the kernel, and you know, eight eight months, ten months later, they come in and they say, "Well, this is implemented," uh, but they haven't wrote the code themselves, right? I mean, they 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 started the discussions on the mailing list. They were able to motivate others, and then it became kind of a community effort uh, with very very little code coming from them or so. Then how would you? Uh, when it comes to the performance management, how do you manage that? Okay, well, you know, they didn't actually implement it completely or they didn't do it by themselves, but they motivated others and they worked with other companies and individuals to get it done. So, and, and you know, another example is, you know, also from Samsung is when, you know, I joined in, they, you know, my management in Korea has set on me, you know, a set of metrics that I need to meet. And one of them is number of patches. Uh, which was kind of pretty useless because you know you can have um, somebody produce a thousand patch a year uh, of very little technical value, uh, and somebody else create you know produce uh, you know twenty patches for that same period of time of really high impact and high technical value. But following these metrics, the person who produced a thousand patch will um, will get um, you know higher bonus. Um, and, you know, they would be promoted within the company and all of that, while the person who produced the most meaningful work, just because the number of patches didn't add up, right? So, um, so all of that just to say, you know, you know, it's a hard exercise to come up with meaningful metrics. Um, um, and there are actually a lot of literature out there coming from different OSPOs uh, and, and different companies on how they work with metrics, and I highly recommend to you um, you you kind of look at that. Uh, create and outsource open source training. Personally, I'm a I'm a big believer of on, of training. Um, I've established training courses on compliance, on open source development um, methodology, uh, and had my engineers create trainings on the different uh, um, projects we you know we focus on. You know, from the kernel to JStreamer to web engines, uh, you know, X, Y, Z. And we used to deliver these trainings to, to junior developers and mentor them. Uh, and, um, you know, within six to eight months, we're able to see really high impact in terms of uh, much improved code, but also in some cases, uh, developers graduating in the, in the kind of open source communities to becoming committers in, in the different areas. So training and, and uh, mentoring, um, Combined together and, and set in a serious environment actually can can yield to very positive results. Uh, established relationship with Open Source Foundation. Um, um, a lot of the open source project uh, companies rely on and you know critical projects are actually hosted in foundations. You know from the Apache, Mozilla, Linux Foundation, and others. Um, so and and one way to to support these projects really and to drive funding to them in some cases. Um, is to get involved with the foundation and and you know, be part of the efforts and the various committees set up and you know in terms of, um, you know within that specific foundations. Um, so one of the exercises I always recommend is kind of to survey your project, figure out which project holds it, which foundation, and kind of set up a plan on um, getting involved there based on your requirements and your priorities. Um, Establish framework for open sourcing internal code. Uh, this is part of kind of uh, contributing. Uh, there are kind of two paths for contributing. You contribute code that was created for the purpose of being upstreamed, but also you have a lot of existing code that was created, uh, intentionally created to be proprietary code, and over time realize that there is value in making this code open source. Okay, so how do you go about this? Because it's a different process than um, your kernel engineer who's writing code every day and was kind of uh, uh, an approval blanket on everything they write to, to make it open source. So there has to be some kind of a framework to, to guide the decision on this is internal proprietary code. It's already in production in different places. Uh, we want to take it, clean it up, 
um, announce it as an open source project and try to develop it in the open. So how to do that? And this is what I mean by framework. Uh, there has to be some process and policy that um, that guide that decision uh, and some due diligence exercise that goes through the various technical business, and in some cases legal um, um, questions that will arise from 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 that and address them. Uh, encourage collaboration, um, internal collaboration, and enable them. Yeah, inner sourcing. So inner sourcing has been kind of you know hot keyword for the past few years, uh, which is basically the practice of looking at open source practices, development practices that that have worked really well uh, in the open to foster and kind of enable that collaboration across um, geographies, across companies, and so on and learn from them and try to import them inside the company and adopt them in internal development. So um, one of the ways, um, and, and you know, as from personal experience, um, having adopted inner sourcing uh, or some of the, uh, you know, inner sourcing practices in different companies, uh, one of the side benefits we get was all the kind of new hires we get all the university graduates that come to us as new hires who don't have any previous experience in open source, um, they get kind of trained on the open source way of doing things internally just by, you know, using inner source practices that are within the company. And within a few months, they're actually well trained to be uh, open source developers in that sense, right? So. Uh, so they come in and they see how we're doing things and transitioning them to work on open source project is um, kind of not that hard because they already know how to work on mailing lists. They already um, work really well with GitHub. They, you know, and, and they know how to work with people outside of different time zone and, and, and things like that. Um, so there are a lot of different benefits to adopting inner sourcing than, than um, just the direct benefits that, that you would get. Um, participate and host open source event, kind of be visible, they must show your work, uh, meet the collaborators you work with, seek new ones. Um, and, you know, I, I work at the Linux Foundation and we host these large events and we have a number of companies who are extremely good at um, kind of participating in these events. They're, you know, they are at every single event. Some companies send in 20, 30, 40 people. Um, and these are these events are really a great place to network and um, meet meet people and and try to explore opportunities for collaboration with others. And you know, I was at the Phoenix event uh, for two days in in November. I don't I, and really a great event. I met a lot of people that otherwise I would have never met. Um, different industries um, fostered a couple of new collaboration that otherwise wouldn't have happened. Right. And, and I consider myself an experienced person. So, so, so imagine for a software developer who's working on a new project and trying to demonstrate what they're doing, you know, having, you know, giving them the opportunity to do this at a, at a stage in front of other developers is really extremely useful. Um, establish open source R&D projects with universities is kind of a hidden, um, um, kind of a hidden gem in a way where, um, I don't think companies do enough of that. And I was lucky to, to establish some of these cooperation in the past few years. Uh, and it was um, really eye-opening to the, the amazing talent that exists today in, in the universities. Uh, so we, you know, one of the practices I would um, highly consider is, you know, explore um, computer science programs in universities um, near you. Kind of visit them, try to figure out how to get involved with with them, either through inter internship or graduate projects, um, and generally just seek seek out collaboration with the professors leading the different research there. Um, we, I've had personally multiple um, collaborations with fantastic results out of that. So um, please think of that. Uh, update outsourcing agreements, uh, MA practices, and so on. Uh, this is kind of a compliance. Um, from a compliance perspective, um, as you work with third party software providers and, and other companies delivering software to you, um, 
most of your outsourcing or supply chain agreements need to be updated to make sure that uh, pro software providers or even hardware providers giving you hardware with drivers, um, this you know provides all the disclaimers in relation to open source and are in compliance when they actually deliver the product to you. Uh, same thing for MA practices um, in terms of you know acquisitions or or mergers or anything uh, of that sort. Um, and I think this might be my last um, um, kind of practice or kind of recommendation is join the to do group. Uh, some of you may be aware of it. It's it's a group operating under the Linux Foundation umbrella um, of um, maybe close to, to, to maybe 80 companies now or something like that, um, that um, most of these companies either have an open source program office or actually are in the process of building one. And they joined the to-do group, which is kind of uh, the collection of companies with open source offices. And it works as, um, as a group of um, peers where they collaborate on the different projects they're working on. Um, they exchange best practices. They, um, they work on common problems facing open source program offices in general and so on. Um, so if, if you have an open source program office, or even if you don't have one, but planning to do one, uh, this is really a great uh, group uh, to, to join. There's, there are no fees or anything like that. It's just a, a mailing list and GitHub repo and a website, and uh, they have their own events. They meet frequently face-to-face. -face. They have their calls um, uh, and so on. So um, um, please check their website. I think it's, it's a great resource that is available um, at your fingerprints. Um, <clears throat> And formalizing open source career paths, this was very interesting. Uh, in the past two companies I worked at, where um, where the company, you know, where I worked with HR to formalize kind of uh, an open source position versus kind of software developer. And I think the lines are becoming more blurry as as the month and the year progress. But but you know, in the past you know four or five years, um, we did that and. Um, it was a way for us to to force a new new way of relating engineers and a new way of promotion uh, and so on. Because typically uh, engineers were being promoted based on product achievement, based on um, 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 and, and they were rewarded based on uh, product sales or product you know shipping on time and things like that. And that these metrics don't specifically apply to open source developers who are mostly focused. And on working with people outside of the company, uh, and not necessarily on product. So we had to break break that um, these metrics and, and these kind of um, um, way of, of 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 rewarding engineers inside the company. And the easiest path for for me at that point was to to create kind of a new category of engineers, you know, open source developers um, that are kind of evaluated differently, rewarded differently, and with different expectation and different promotional path. And that worked really well. Um, so as closing, I think, uh, from, a, an open source perspective, there are a lot of challenges, uh, you will, as an industry, you know, finan you know, financial services and as individual companies, uh, you will go through as part of, um, using consuming, um, you know, um, contributing to open source projects and building that open source presence. And I think they can be classified in, you know, in five different buckets. You may classify them differently. Um, you know, culture, uh, processes, tooling, uh, continuity, and education. And within each of this bucket, there are different uh, challenges that, you know, you either will hit or, you know, you're lucky, you know, your company is already um, there in, in terms of a mindset that it's not going to be a big challenge for you. But these are kind of different challenges um, you might go through in, um, in your work. And actually, a lot of these challenges are things that the to-do group looks at and try to identify ways, try to identify ways to, to resolve them. Um, so for me, I think the four key pillars are uh, you know, consumption and compliance, you know, you, you, you know, companies start being curious, they start using open source, uh, then they wake up one day and they're like, oh my God, we rely so much on this stuff. 
uh, we need to, to 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 participate in the process of creating the code and be influential in these projects. And then uh, it filters down to, you know, okay, these are the 30 critical projects that if these projects don't continue to thrive and grow, we completely, uh, we will be completely hurt on the product. And this is where you want to become a leader in these communities. Um, and I think, um, you know, when we look at open source in general, um, really open source is eating the software world. Right? I said that earlier. And we have uh, two options. One, we can sit and watch the show uh, or we can actually be part of it. And I, I very much um, believe we should be part of the show and be part of creating and expanding that ecosystem. And, you know, I started working open source uh, in the late in, in the 19, 1990s, right? But then I moved to become paid open source. Uh, I started my career as a developer in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and I've seen different um, technology sectors, different industry yield to open source. First, uh, in the telecom, in the back end with Ericsson and Motorola, then on the mobile side, then within the, uh, you know, of course, the web and internet back then, then throughout the years, you know, with different technology verticals. And now, you know, finance is one of many. There's finance, there's energy, and there's healthcare that are kind of the three top runners where we see open source um, creating the next wave. Um, and I would love to be in your shoes in a sense where you have the opportunity to 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 create that and, and establish open sources in your organization in, in, in a new vertical is extremely exciting and extremely um, um, motivating. Um, so as references, there, there are a lot of references you can refer to. I think the, the group has a really fantastic set of guides. Uh, I think they have um, maybe 10 to 12 guides that, that were created by the different leaders of open source groups within their membership. Um, and the Linux Foundation also have uh, plenty of um, publications on, on that topic. Um, so as um, just before I close, uh, so one of the interesting uh, um, we've done at Linux Foundation is, um, and I'm, I'm doing this actually next week for LF Energy. Uh, LF Energy is our new umbrella foundation focused on um, uh, open source in the energy sector, is creating what we call kind of an open source bootcamp. And I have here a screenshot of the schedule. Um, and, you know, from an energy perspective, you know, the companies um, uh, with the uh, creating the energy and distributing energy, they're, they're absolutely not, not software driven and not by any mean anywhere close to, to being an open source consumer. And we're kind of working with them on transforming and unlocking uh, these potentials in the energy sector. So the schedule you see on the screen, uh, some parts of it are very beginner, right? But what I'm, um, what I'm trying to communicate with you now is if this is of interest, we can certainly uh, work with you on creating kind of an open source bootcamp focused uh, for the financial industry or financial services industry and uh, focused on topics um, that are of interest to you at the level that you'd like, and we can collaborate on making it, uh, you know, half day or a day, uh, and it can be, I think, um, a, a great place for, you know, not not a conference style, but more of a workshop style. Uh, just a thought. Um, so this is actually my last slide. Uh, again, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak, and I think we have uh, plenty of time. Um, if you have any questions um, that you you would like to throw my way. This is Aaron. I just uh, wanted to jump in and, and uh, give one more resource that um, maybe Ibrahim was too uh, humble to mention, but uh, he's written an incredibly valuable and comprehensive ebook um, called Open Source Compliance in the Enterprise that um, the Linux Foundation puts out as a free PDF download. Uh, and it, it, you know, it, it covers just about everything that you'd want covered. Um, on setting up an open source program office and, and on your various compliance related obligations. So I highly recommend checking that out as well. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. 
Does anyone have questions for Ibrahim? Note that you may have to unmute yourself to ask them. Well, it, it sounds like you must have covered everything then, Ibrahim. Um, thank you so much for a terrific presentation. Um, we loved having you and uh, would love to have you back. Uh, I'm seeing a comment in the group chat. No question, but general comment. This was fantastic. Uh, I fully agree. Um, we'd love to have you back anytime. Uh, and uh, same goes for all the new participants on this call. Uh, if you would like to uh, receive the slides from today's talk and haven't yet gotten them from me, um, or you would like to be added to the recurring invitation for this meeting or added to the mailing list, um, you can send me an email, Aaron, A-A-R-O-N, at finos.org, and I will set you up. Uh, thanks to everyone, um, and especially to Ibrahim. Thank you, Aaron. So, so just you know, one more comment just before we hang up. Um, you know, I, you, as part of my role at the LF, I'm actually focused on building the AI open source ecosystem, but, but also I have side responsibilities of being generally supportive to any company out there um, who is embarking on this journey. And, and with that, I'd like, you know, making myself available to, to everyone here, uh, you know, Phoenix members, um, or in general, just, you know, even if, if your company is not a Phoenix member, but in the finance industry. So, uh, if, if, you know, if you guys want to do a call, want to, you know, discuss any given topic within anything that I've discussed today, um, I'm, I'm more than happy to, you know, to, to make myself available. And, you know, I fly not that often, but often enough to New York because I have some members in my foundation based in New York and New Jersey for working on open source AI. So we can also look at a possibility of visiting your office and doing kind of a um, small, you know, round table discussion with your open source team and so on. So just a general note that, you know, although um, this is not AI specific, I'm, I'm available to to, to help your companies and, and generally just be available if if you guys want to reach out and, and ask me anything. Um, my, my contact information, uh, my email is on the slide, so um, please feel, feel free to reach out anytime. Okay, thank you so much, Ibrahim, and thanks everyone for joining. Uh, we'll see you in two weeks.